they've just had a, a conversation. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm kind of interrupting. It, it, I'm going to put you in the middle of it because this is where he, I think Jordan Peterson brings Ayn Rand up for the first time um, and introduces what he thinks his problem was with Ayn Rand, although it's it's not that clear. Ian wants me to play to one and a half times. I don't know. Can we really do that? Can we play to one and a half times? I mean, I, that seems wrong, right? We played it. What should we do? Oh, we'll play 1.25. But if it's too fast, please tell me because, uh, you know, I don't want to be, I also don't want to be disrespectful here um, about this. Uh, Ali asked what's about Jordan Peterson's suits. He has really strange suits now. Some of them are multicolored and, and really weird. I, in, in England, I saw him, he had a strange suit. So he's experimenting with, with suit colors and suits which is interesting because it's so, it so defeats the purpose of wearing a suit to begin with, which is to be, in a sense, conventional. Um, so um, uh, Valkon says, 0.5 would be too fast if it was Ben Shapiro. Chris says 1.25 is good. Well, you'll tell me once I play it if 1.25 is good. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's do this. Um, tell me if the volume is appropriate, their volume, my volume, and all of that. Let me know in the chat. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is, you know, I don't know to what degree you would still ally yourself with the anarchist movement, and I want to know what, to what degree you do. And also, I would like to know what that means. You opened your book with Ayn Rand. Yeah. And I know that's a bit of a tangential intrusion into that question, but she's definitely an arbiter or a, a, or a spokeswoman for an individualistic stance. So yes, I, I want to correct. talk to you about Ayn Rand, because I have some... So first, I think the worst thing about this interview, from my perspective, I think, again, malice achieves what he wants. But from my perspective, the worst thing about this interview is that malice achieves a conflation in Jordan Peterson's mind between anarchy and Ayn Rand. That is, there's an overlap that he achieves between the two. And he manages, and, and I don't think Jordan Peterson holds those as two separate things. I mean, Jordan has a problem with separating, I think, politics and ethics completely because he, he's oriented towards hierarchy and organization and subsidiarity, which you'll talk about, and stuff like that, which are all kind of political concepts. But he talks about them in the context of uh, of ethics. So uh, to begin with, that's a problem for Jordan. And then what happens is that uh, it, 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 malice achieves, and I think, I don't know that he set out to do this, but it's a, it's an achievement for him, the, the conflation in Jordan Peterson's mind between Ayn Rand's ethics and anarchy and anarchism, which I think is completely wrong. I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a completely... Uh, um, complete distortion of her worldview, uh, you know, and, and, and Malice knows that. Uh, well, he knows that she thought that. He, he might think that she was wrong, that, that uh, the, the logic of her reasoning from individualism or from rational egoism is uh, anarchy. But again, in, in Jordan Peterson, he keeps referring to this anarchy and then Ayn Rand, and he keeps going back and forth, and anarchy and individualism, anarchy is individualism. That is a unity, and that unfortunately is, is very destructive and very distortive. Uh, Ayn Rand's view is not consistent with anarchy. Um, it, it not consistent at all with anarchy. Uh, and, um, and I don't think that doesn't come across here at all. Even though Malice might at some point say something about Ayn Rand not being an anarchist, which I'm not sure he does, but, it, but maybe he does. Um, That's not the issue. It's not what she held. It's what is the logical conclusion from her views about ethics? Do they lead to anarchy? And clearly, they don't. And uh, and uh, in this and, and here uh, and here in Jordan minds, Jordan's mind matters. We know, but in Jordan mind, the two are conflated, and that is very very bad. So uh, that's sad that the two are related. You just saw that in this little exchange where he wants to talk to him about anarchism, but you bring up Ayn Rand in your book, which he does in the first page, I think, 
Yeah, and and I want to talk to you about Iron Man. Some sure. ideas about that sure. that I want, but I, I'm also curious. You 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 obviously regard a focus on the individual as the appropriate medication against this kind of status, intellectual, Luciferian yes. utopianism, and I think that's I think that's appropriate. But I want to know what what your what your vision of an alternative is, and why you why you adopted that particular vision. Well, I don't know that I have a vision for saying I'm not a central planner. Yeah. Well, but that's silly. I mean, with all due respect to Michael, I mean that's silly. Of course, he has a vision. His vision is anarchy, right? His vision is 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 a is a uh, is a uh, you know, society in which there is no government and in which, uh, uh, you know, people organize in, in a variety of different ways and a variety of different people speculate on what that looks like. But there is a vision. It might not be a vision of the, uh, you know, absolute concretes of everything. So, so I think that's, I think that's, anyway. Yeah, yeah, right. But what anarchism means to me, and I, I do 100% regard myself as an anarchism, is it is an approach to life. It is an approach to treating people peacefully. Uh, it is uh, a recognition that political authority is inherently illegitimate, although sometimes it is powerful. Um, and it is regarding the, our existence as an amazing opportunity and to live life to its fullest. And now here, here's where he conflates it, right? So here he's explicitly conflating anarchism with a morality of living life to the fullest. Right, he is complete. Now, I'm not. I'm not going to critique his anarchism. Right, it's not the purpose of what I'm here for right now. We're not talking about malice and anarchy. I've done the anarchy thing, and soon you'll see an essay that uh, Don Watkins and I wrote about um, anarchy. It'll be on um, on um, the guy I, I I debated recently. Anyway, it'll it'll be it, it it'll be up on our website sometime in January. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, but I, I don't want to spend today talking about anarchy. I want to spend it about Ayn Rand and ethics. But notice how he's taken the discussion of anarchy, a political concept, a political... Uh, Brian Kaplan, thank you. <laughs> so it'll be on Brian Kaplan's blog at some point. It's a long essay on uh, objections to anarchy. He's taken this uh, a political concept, and he's conflating the political concept with... Uh, uh, an ethics of, of living your life to the fullest. A and I get it. I, it. Malice, to some extent, holds us in his mind like this. But it does. Uh, it, that's really damaging. That's really damaging. Because when I say live your life to the fullest, the implication of that is not anarchy. The implication of that is the, is the counter. It, it, it is a government. It is a strong government that does only one thing. But it is a government. And, and not all government, as you know, I think is illegitimate. To realize that to take that away from somebody else uh, is a huge, you know, moral outrage. So that is kind of what anarchism means to me. Okay, okay. And, and so, Rand was asked uh, at one point, she goes, if I had to sum up my worldview or whatever term she used in one word, it would be this, individualism. So yes, that is exactly. Yeah, so that's where, okay, okay. Yes. So, so let me delve into that a little bit. But it's also just important because, you know, Berkman and Goldman, uh, there's this boomer idea that more government. Yeah, I'm gonna skip this, this Bergman, and he goes into this. Uh, I'm gonna skip this a little bit. We have to skip some stuff. So we're gonna skip this. Less interesting for our purposes. We're gonna go here. He read Rand, Ayn Rand's books, The Fountainhead and uh, Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. In, I think it's the third time I read both of them. And third I read time. them within the last couple of months. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So I was, you know, now and then I, I'm looking for a, I don't know, a romantic read, maybe, that's somewhat intellectually challenging. And now and then I'll pick up one of her books. And she's. And that's pretty good because he recognized her for what she is. Uh, and, and she's obviously inspired him. Otherwise, he wouldn't read it three times. So there's something going on here. There's some appeal that she has that, that, that attracts Jordan Peterson to her, but he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it, and he, and, he, and he, I think he struggles within himself with the idea that he likes the books, he enjoys the books, they, they provide him with some, something, and yet he rejects their philosophy, and he's, he's really struggling with how to align all that. Curious finger to me, because Ayn Rand had every reason to despise the Soviet Union and was a very good counter voice to their machinations. But, but, well, and you know, I got introduced to her books. It was quite interesting. So I worked for the socialists when I was like 14 till I was 16 before I... We don't actually get to the but, uh, but, but this is interesting. This is how we got introduced to Ayn Rand uh, as, 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 through socialism, uh, funnily enough. So here's another guy who started out on the Figure left. 
I didn't know enough to presume that the way I wanted to arrange the world in a utopian fashion was credible. And I figured that out by the time I was about 17. I thought, oh, well, what do you know? You don't have a job. I had little jobs. You know, you don't have a business. You don't have a family. You don't have any education. It's like, what the hell do you know? Really? Right. So, okay. Anyways, the person who gave me Ayn Rand's books was this woman, Sandy Notley. She was the mother of one of Alberta's recent premiers, a socialist premier, and she was the wife of the only elected socialist official in Alberta when I grew up. And I asked her why she gave me Solzhenitsyn and, and Huxley and Orwell. Like, she was an educated woman. And, and she gave me Ayn Rand's books, which I read when I was like 13. And, you know, they're, I found them compelling. Yeah. You know, they've got that, they're, they're romantic adventures, fundamentally, yes. with an intellectual bent. And I like the anti-collective ethos that was embedded in them. And then I've read them, like I said, a couple of times since then. So here's the problem I have, and, and you can help me sort this out. Like, I certainly agree with you that a society that isn't predicated on something like recognition of the intrinsic and superordinate worth of the individual is doomed to catastrophe, right? And so, but then, but here's the rub as far as I'm concerned, and this is what I had really had a problem with, especially this time when I went through Rand's books. It's like her Galt, John Galt, for example, and Francisco de Danconia, her, 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 and, and the, who, who's the architect? Uh, Howard Rourke. Rourke, Rourke, Rourke her, her heroic capitalists, essentially. They're not precisely heroic capitalists, they're heroic individualists yes. who compete in the free market. Okay, and that's, and that's fine. And you can see the libertarian side of that. And I'm also a free market advocate, and partly because I think that distributed decision-making is a much better computational model right. than centralized planning, right. obviously. It's not obvious. Right. I mean, that's, that's Hayek, and it's certainly not Rand's argument, and, and it's not a very deep argument. The much more fundamental argument, even from that perspective, is that only an individual, only the individual can actually identify his own values and, and, and determine how much anything is worth to him. That is, there's no, nobody can figure that out for him because nobody knows him. Only you can make decisions about yourself. It's not a, it's not a computational efficiency issue because if it was, then as some people are suggesting these days, we could, we could appoint a, a AI dictator, artificial intelligence who solves the computational problem. We could have this massive computer that can solve all the computations in the world. And yet, AI could not be a central planner, not because it lacks computational power, not because it lacks computational efficiency, but because the reality is that, well, one, it can't think in, in any meaningful sense, right? It can't actually think. And that's why it's not a computational issue, it's a thinking issue. But it can't make value choices for individuals because only individuals can make value choices for themselves. And that is really, really fundamental. And that is something that he should have been stopped on right here and it should have been told to him, right? So Hayek is right as far as it goes, but making it into a computational problem and, and, and you know, I think Michael in a second will reinforce this, making it into a computational problem makes the issue human ignorance or, or the issue uh, limited human ability to compute, uh, the limit of human reason, as Hayek would state it. And that's not the issue. This is not the limitations. The issue is, the issue is the fact that only individuals can value, and therefore only individuals can know what their values are, and only individuals can know what worth their values have to them. So every value has to be to whom and for what. And no central planner can answer that question. It doesn't know what my values are for, and how much I'm willing, what I'm willing to do for them, how important they are. He doesn't have my value hierarchy. hierarchy. And you probably can't even get that from a questionnaire, right? So, and my values change all the time. And they change with context, circumstances. And of course, as Bonnie says, we're volitional animals, so we change our minds. And no central planner can do that, can, can get into our mind. I guess if we're all like in the matrix connected, our brains are connected and they can read our minds, you know, okay, so then maybe all our needs can be, all our wants, desires can be satisfied. But, yeah. Well, 
Well, yeah, it should be. Sure. But it should be. It's not obvious to utopian Luciferian intellects, but it's obvious even if you just think about it from a computational perspective. Well, I'll just say this. He has this great, he has great one line as, uh, was it Luciferian, utopian Luciferian, something or other. I mean, you got to give it, he, he, he's a master at one line as an, a, a wordsmithing and, and putting, putting, the smartest words, person like is ignorant of 99.99% of knowledge. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the smartest person is ignorant of 99.9% .9 of knowledge. That's not an argument for anything. <laughs> that's not an argument for anything. So, I mean, that's the problem. It's the Hayekian argument, which is wrong and belittles human reason and human uh, capacity. And if I had, a, 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 again, an AI who was not ignorant, ignorant of 99.9% .9 of knowledge, would that be okay then? Would he be able to? Would he be able to master plan, uh, essentially plan the universe? Of course not. Exactly. Well, that exactly. exactly. Well, that's yes. exactly it. It's the, it, precisely why you want it distributed. Okay, so that's partly what I want to go into. So now the the rand. It's not exactly to say distributed. You want it individualized. You want individuals making decisions for themselves because only individuals know what they want. Only individuals know what their values are. Only individuals know what their life requires. So it, it's not an issue of distributed. It's an issue of individuated. Andean heroes identify themselves as fervent individualists, and they and you stop me as soon as I get any of this wrong, or in some way you don't disagree with. They're pursuing their own selfish ethos. Yes. Right? Okay. So that's the rub to me because. I, and I, I would think I'm going to think about this psychologically and neurophysiologically. So just to make it complicated. Okay. So the first question would be, well, what exactly do you mean by the individual and the self? Okay. And, and here there's another video of him going into the fact that there is no such thing as a self or an individual because what you are right now is not the same as what you're going to be in a year. And is, uh, so it's two individuals. It's not exactly an individual. I mean, it, which is nonsense and, and completely wrong in terms of how you frame it. Um, but here he takes it in a different direction, uh, which is a little all over the place, so be patient. Okay, so when a child develops, let's say, when a child first emerges into the world, they're essentially a system of somewhat disconnected primary instinctual sub-personalities, right? And so they, with, the, with the nascent possibility of a uniting ego, identity, personality, something like continued, a continued... Uh, a, a continuity of memory across time, and, but that has to emerge. Now it seems to emerge as a consequence of neurophysiological development and experiential maturation. And so, you know, the child comes equipped into the world, say with a sucking reflex, because its, it's mouth and tongue are very wired up. So that's where the child is most conscious. That's why kids, when they can, put everything in their mouth, because they can feel it and <laughs> investigate it far, far before they have control over their eyes or their arms, because their arms sort of float around. And so what happens is they, they, they're born as a set of somewhat independent systems. And then the independent systems, partly under the influence of, of social demand, integrate themselves. Right. Okay. Now, so, and, and then, like, by the time a child is two, that child is still mostly disintegrated emotional systems. And so if you watch a two-year-old, and I use two for a specific reason, what you see is that they cycle through basic motivational states. One of the challenges of, of being interviewed by Jordan Peterson is he goes on in these rants, and you have to follow it and you have to figure out on the spot, sitting there, how you're going to respond. And that is really, really, really hard to do. <laughs> um, because what's he talking about? Now, some of what he's saying makes kind of sense. I've heard it now three times. But imagine hearing it just once, as you are. I mean, how many of you know what he's talking about? It, 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 you know, it, it, and it's... What's the question? Where is he going with this? Very difficult. So a child is often like a child wh whose demand-oriented motivational states are satiated with play, right? And play and explore. But then they get tired and they'll cry or they'll get hungry and they'll cry or they'll get angry and they'll have a tantrum or, you know, or they'll burst into tears. Well, I said they'll cry and or they'll get anxious, right? And so they're cycling through these primary motivational states. Now, we understand that to some degree neurophysiologically, neurophysi because the older the brain system, the more likely it is to be operative in infancy, right? So like the rage system or the system that mediates anxiety or the system that mediates pain, those come into being pretty early. It's hard for them to get integrated. Okay, now, 
here's the problem. And I don't know how to distinguish individualism from hedonism. And I don't know how to distinguish hedonism from possession by one of these lower order motivational states. So when, when Rand... So that's a really good question, right? And he doesn't. He doesn't know how to distinguish e egoism or, or, or selfishness or self-interest from hedonism or from one of these lower states, the perceptual level or the, or the emotional states. Uh, and and what, what, of course, what he's missing here and what malice doesn't bring up and won't bring up and is the standard human survival, human flourishing, human happiness, the standard. And the, 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 the you know, uh, uh, integrating virtue, rationality. That is, so it, what, is, what is differentiate selfishness from hedonism? Well, one is the standard is this necessary for human survival? Is it necessary for human flourishing? Is it necessary for human survival qua human being, i.e. qua conceptual being? And how do we know whether something is necessary or not? How do we know whether something is hedonistic, maybe even self-destructive, versus something that is productive and, 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 and building and, and virtuous? Well, we know by the standard of human life by the standard of human flourishing. And we know that through the use of reason, the application of reason, by rationally figuring out, by looking at reality, by looking at what kind of animal human beings are, what their nature is, what kind of action will lead to positive outcomes, what kind of actions lead to negative outcomes. And, and that is the only way we can figure out what is in our self-interest, what selfishness means. But that's what needs to be explained to Jordan. I mean, and, and this would have been such a perfect place to do it because he's raising the right questions. He's thinking about the right issues. Now, I don't know if he could accept it. I don't, I don't know if he could integrate it because his mind is, is, is all over the place. But what an opportunity you have here to actually discuss what it is about selfishness that makes it not hedonism and what it is that selfishness is and what it even means. In other words, what it, mean, what it really means in the sense of, again, human survival, human flourishing. And, and that just doesn't happen. So it's a massive blown opportunity to actually articulate what needs to be articulated in this context. And of course, reason, right? The, 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 the whole idea of reason, the whole idea of rationality as the integrator is so crucial and the means by which we survive. Reason as a means of survival, a basic means of survival, as Elaine Pico puts it, that needs to be said here. That needs to be here. Right. And pff, again, missed opportunity. It doesn't come up. There's none of it there. Again, I give credit to Jordan. He's asking the right questions. He's conflicted here between those, you know, ingrained, almost animalistic tendencies that we're maybe born with uh, and hedonism and, and this concept of selfishness and how do they relate and what's a, yes, that's a good question. But he needs an answer and he doesn't get one. He says we should be able to pursue our own selfish needs. She's kind of taking a class. She doesn't say selfish needs, she says self-interest. Okay, okay, so fine. Okay, okay, so, so that, no, well, no, she, I would say she moves between those two because she there are. She says needs, I'm positive. Okay. Yeah, she never says needs, which is true, but that's not the point. <laughs> it's not the, the point here is not the needs the point here is not the needs the point is here what does selfishness mean what does it mean where does it come from and what is the measure by which we can say something is selfish and something is not what is the objective standard for determining what is hedonistic 
what is animalistic, if you will, and what is selfish. That's what needs, that's the point that needs to be made here. And now they go into this complete sidetrack on needs, which is not essential, not essential, not that important. I mean, it's good to point out that she doesn't talk about selfish needs, but it's not, it, it, again, blown opportunity. Okay, she may never say she needs. She attacks that word all the okay, time. Okay, okay, right, right, fair enough. Okay, okay, so I'll back off on the needs side. That was the old chosen, and she does, she makes absolutely bloody sure. Well, wait a second. She, she says, no. your needs are not a blank check in my I, I know, I know, yeah. but does, but, but she doesn't, does she say simultaneously that I have no right to pursue my needs? She doesn't use that word. She says, you pursue your self-interest to the best of your abilities. Okay, but she also uses the word selfish. Yes. Okay, okay, it so fine. In a very wanna, way. Right, okay, right, absolutely, absolutely. I would just want to make sure that we're... But this is a great opportunity to explain what selfish is. And more importantly, where it comes from and what the context is and what the standard is, the standard of all value, your life. As a conceptual being. And that's... Proceeding on grounds that we both regard as appropriate. So the liberal types, the Scottish liberals, believe that if people were encouraged to pursue their self-interest, that that would produce a, a, a self-regulating right. system. Now, Ramsey... See, now he goes to politics. So he's, 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 he's going from selfishness qua individual to selfishness as a, a system, Adam Smith and so on. And again, here's another opportunity to differentiate Ayn Rand from the Scottish. Adam Smith and Scots would say, if everybody, Adam Smith and Scots say, if everybody pursues their self-interest... While that in and of itself is not good, it actually produces a better society. But Rand rejects that whole formulation. Rand's view is self-interest is the good. It is the good. It, it, there's nothing else in terms of good other than to pursue your self-interest. And yes, if every individual pursues his self-interest, a social group is better off. But that's not the reason, that's the consequence. And it's, um, again, frustrating that he doesn't get a counter to that. That is, he, he, he's, he's pitching softballs here. <laughs> he doesn't need to be answered. And, and every time he does this, there's a great opportunity to make an interesting point about Rand. Now, again... As I said in the beginning, it's not Malice's job. He's not here to defend Ayn Rand. He's here to defend anarchy and defend his book on communism. I get it. I'm not criticizing, in that sense, I'm not criticizing Malice. It's just, uh, it's unfortunate. It's just unfortunate he's not talking, Jordan Peterson's not talking to an objectivist and asking these exact questions to an objectivist. Andrew says, you on these are uh, only softballs to serious objectives. Yes, I, I agree, but it's too bad he's not talking to serious objectives. That would Seems be cool. to accept that as a proposition. Yes? Yes. So if people are freely able to pursue their self-interest, then a system of free exchange will emerge out of that that has the appropriate qualities of governance. Yes. And what we would say is, what a serious objectivist somebody says, is yes, only, and that system emerges... That system emerges when and if individual rights are protected. That is, as long as I'm protected from the goon, the thief, the, 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 the bad guy who is going to... Um, who, who, who is going to... Uh, who, who is going to violate people's rights. Ali says, why blaming Malice JP doesn't let him talk and keep projecting his wrong ideas and getting short answers? Not a big fan of you. No, I mean, Malice can talk, as you'll see in a little bit. He talks. He has no problem talking. And, and Jordan Peterson will let him speak when Malice talks. And, and Malice is fine with interjecting. Like when he said needs, she doesn't talk about needs. He can interject and he can, and, and, and he can keep going. So uh, I don't think this is because of JP. I think Malice is missing opportunities here, partially because I don't think he knows the material deeply, partially because he's not motivated. Because when you get into anarchy, 
it, it, which I'm not going to I'm not going to play here. But when he gets to the issue of anarchy, he is very articulate and goes on and on and on as long as he wants to. So uh, I, I don't think this is about uh, malice being too shy or too ref- differential or J.P. Morgan being uh, J.P. <laughs> Jordan Peterson being too, uh, 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 you know, too, uh, um, I don't know, uh, not letting him speak. Uh, I think this is more about, you know, what's, you know, what the, what the, what his priorities are, what he wants to talk about, what he wants to emphasize, right? All right, um, let's see. We're going to go on a little bit, and then I'm going to skip ahead. Let me just see what one... Th- yeah, there's another 30 minutes of this, so uh, let me just She go. says this explicitly on Donahue. She was yeah, asking, okay. saying that if people pursued their own self-interest, there wouldn't be any oppression, there wouldn't be war, there wouldn't be any Hitler, she, because there would, should they be less? And she goes, there wouldn't be any. Yeah. Well, yeah. look, when I'm negotiating with someone... But it, but it's also the case... Whoops. I just, I just wiped that out. What did I do? All right, uh, it, it's also the case that you know, she believed that they need to be, that governance needs to exist. Government needs to exist. Protecting individual rights needs to happen. But of course, Malice doesn't believe in that, doesn't agree with that. All right, let's see. Um, what do I want to take us? One, let's go to 128. All right. I mean, there's so many, there's, so, there, there's other stuff here. Uh, but I'm 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 just gonna I'm just gonna skip this. Uh, da, 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 127, 128, subsidiarity. Uh, no, I want to go to 133. One second. 133. I mean, I mean, I think. Well, anyway, Malice brings up the Enlightenment a couple of times, and, and, and he's undermining the Enlightenment constantly, which, again, is, is so wrong, and, and uh, 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 it's just a misrepresentation of the Enlightenment, but it undermines Rand's key idea about morality and about life, which is the value of reason, the value of rational thought, and, and Malice is undermining that, and I think that's purposefully, because, you know, he obviously disagrees. He says at some point he disagrees with Ayn Rand. He says something about Ayn Rand thinks that if we all got together and we had exactly the same facts, we'd all come to exactly the same conclusion, which is just not true, because, again, we have different values. We'd all come to the same conclusion in terms of what right or wrong. We'd all come to the same conclusion in terms of science. Does he disagree about science? So, so what exactly is it that we wouldn't come to the same conclusion around? time preference into it, you're starting to work in the domain that implicitly assumes that there is a higher order integration. So these, yes. these initial systems, these initial motivational systems, they're very short term. So, and they want short term gratification. So when a baby wails, when it cries, it wants to be satisfied now. But can I say one thing? Yes. This is the distinction Rand draws between hedonism and her philosophy, because she thinks that the more moral a person, the more long range is thought, whereas hedonism is very much pleasure of the moment. And I'm yeah. going to defend hedonism a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's right. But again, he never explains what, what the context is. That is, you know, long range for what? Long range in what? He talks about, uh, Malice brings up integrity, which I think is good. Uh, he brings up uh, the importance of integrity. But again, without life, without life, without flourishing survival as the standard, you can't really get what integrity is for. He brings up a lot and Jordan Peterson likes this, uh, this idea of, of um, uh, what do you call it, uh, of, uh, you know, after you make a choice, thinking back and, uh, and, and being proud of that or not being proud of it or, 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 you know, about the road less taken or the road you took or didn't take uh, and not being embarrassed by what you've done in the past. But by what standard? Again, you need a standard for all these things. And the standard is Ayn Rand's morality and the standard is ultimately life rational of a rational being the life of a rational being that is the standard you can't undermine reason and rationality and still hold that standard um but it has to be made clear it has to be made explicit 
because the term gets a bad rap. Hedonism isn't Coke orgies. Hedonism is Martha Stewart, where you're having coffee and, and book club with your friends and having the pleasure. That's not right. A hedonism is, uh, you know, the OG, the, 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 the Martha Stewart and having a nice drinking, drinking something nice and reading a book. That's pleasure. Pleasure and hedonism are not the same thing. Hedonism is an ism. It is the elevation of momentary pleasure above all else. So again, there's a, He's wrong. What can I say? That's more than this. Okay, but I would put, you, you can actually separate those texts. Sure, but the point is, because yeah, that kind of hedonism Jordan would Peterson be more right on the aesthetic here. end. Sure. Right, and but, it's more but, sophisticated. But I'm talking about like, Pleasure epic, per se isn't bad. Right, with these Epicurean idea of hedonism, how it was pitched, you know, thousands of years ago, it wasn't at all this maximizing pleasure. In, just in the moment. Life. Yes. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. Well, so, so okay, so we'll just define right. the kind of hedonism sure. that we're objecting to as blinkered by the short term. But I also hate this kind of wasp suspicion of hedonism is pure tactic. Yeah. like if you're having pleasure you're doing something wrong and it's like pleasure is wonderful people should do it more in the sense of i'm reading a nice book i'm enjoying a fire i'm having it walk with my friends These yeah are all well everything in its place is the broad yes, notion yes, for that correct. right yes. right and so so the demand for hedonic gratification shouldn't be put forward in a manner that sacrifices the overall integrity it's the reward yeah yeah i worked hard and now i get to watch a stupid tv show and not right. feel any guilt about it because i did my work for today right right well and it's necessary. I have no shame about it yeah yeah well the psycho psychologists know if they're wise that you you want to have Still. all the forms of motivation that are available to you working uh, if you've got an alternative of watching a stupid tv show or a clever tv show that's entertaining it doesn't require a lot it doesn't require any effort but it's just a little just better why would you go with a stupid one? And why shouldn't you see, feel a little embarrassed about listening to the stupid one? It just doesn't, none of this is really that, it's not right. It's, it's just, everything here is loose. There's very little, it doesn't, it, 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 there's very little accuracy here because again, there's no standard. To push you forward. Yeah. And, and certainly the draw, so technically, the source of reward that people work hardest for isn't satiation reward. You know, they would if they were starving. You know, sure. like you can you can put animals and human beings into a situation yeah, where they work like single-mindedly for satiation, right? right? Like if you haven't had anything to drink for two weeks, right. you're going to be pretty motivated. That aside, and this is something the Soviets understood very well. System that mediates voluntary exploratory activity. Right, so it's a very ancient system. It, it emerges, it's hypothalamic, and the hypothalamus is a part of the brain that sits right on top of the spinal cord. It's an absolutely ancient system. And the pleasure that we generally are most motivated by does activate these systems. And if you want people to be actively engaged in a meaningful way in their own life and in their social pursuits, then you wanna make sure that that system is operating in the direction of those pursuits, right? So then one of the things that happens when people make an agreement is that they set up a shared aim, right? So yes. we, our aim today was to have an interesting conversation that we could share with people. Okay, so that sets up our nervous system. So as long as we're uttering words in a manner that moves us towards that aim, then we're gonna stay engaged and enthusiastic because sure. that, well, because that, the system that produces enthusiasm and engagement is now on board in relationship to that aim. Okay, so imagine this then, so that your aim becomes the participation in the social system that's optimally balanced when people are pursuing their enlightened self-interest in a manner that's of maximal social utility that stretches across the longest possible time span. You see, I can't, he can't really hold it, right? So it has to be enlightened self-interest, it can't just be self-interest. So he has to be enlightened in, enlightened oh, self-interest because that is a way to make it less self-interested in some way. It's, it's a little softer, it's, it's, it's touchy-feely, it's good. And then he has to bring in this social utility, he has to bring in this whole thing. And, and, and Malice says, I, I, I don't have any use for social utility. He doesn't like I... social utility, which is great, absolutely good for him. Again, why? What's the purpose? What's wrong with social utility? Um, it, there's not a lot of getting into that really in, in great depth. But let me just skip a little bit ahead because we're going late here. Um, someone that your family can admire and rely on and knowing that when this shit yep. hits the fan they'll be in a position to reciprocate do you want to be that provider or that right. source of strength again this is your opportunity to, to do be that. that person okay. or do you want to be the guy who's not there for his kids you have that opportunity too right and at the end of the day you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror or avoid make or avoid eye contact in the mirror and yeah. face or waking being. up at three in the morning yeah. being tormented by your conscience yes if yeah but where does this conscience come from right this conscience is is you have to have a standard of value to have a conscience but what is the standard of value what is the value system that you've adopted? And does Rand have a value system that causes you to have this conscience? All of that is 
floating. None of it has been defined. None of it has been explained. And it's floating. So the, the conversation is going nowhere, and it doesn't really integrate into anything. Do you still have one? Or, right, you have, right. or deadening it with alcohol, or whatever the situation might be. So yeah. That, that's right, how okay, so, so well, then that, that was just, what I was trying to portray as a social good. But it's, I, I mean, the, so, the social good is the consequence, not the goal. How about, how about the good is the harmony between the social manifestation that's, and the in, individual manifestation? That's, by the way, one of the better things he said. Social good is the consequence, not the goal. I agree with that. That's the Adam Smith thing, right? Society is somehow better off, however you want to measure it, but that's not the goal of the action. And he's absolutely right. He brings it in. Too little, too late in some ways. It's, it's, explain, articulate. What do you mean? So look, part of the reason I've been thinking this through is because I think that the modern definition of mental health as subjective this is, is sorely good. wrong. Because That's right. I think that mental health is actually the harmony in that hierarchy of being and not something that you have in your head. I mean, right. That is, it is the harmony, the harmony. Uh, uh, it's exactly right. I mean, Jordan Peterson ha is, in, is completely in the right direction here. For philosophy objectivism, so I completely agree with you. I, I, don't, I think anytime you're introducing subjectivism to a large extent, you're treading on thin ice. Okay, so, so then let's go to the object, objective in relationship to what? Like, where's the objective reality that, that Rand's pattern of behavior is aiming to, to, what would you say, to adapt to? And what's the answer there? What is the, I mean, this is a great question. Another one of these great questions Jordan is asking. What is the objective reality that Rand's pattern of behavior is aiming towards. In other words, what is the objective reality that her morality is aiming towards? And this is where the answer, sorry, Michael, but the answer has to be life. The objective standards by which life, what life requires, what nature requires of us as a particular animal to do in order to achieve life to achieve flourishing what particular being with a particular nature with a particular biology with a particular kind of brain mind whatever you want to call it and 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 nature requires reality requires that we pursue certain values using certain virtues to achieve life that's the particular reality that's the that's the answer to what jordan is asking not what malice is. Everywhere. We live in it. There's nowhere else to go. Okay, so it, it, that seems to... So it, it, it's true. This is reality. But, it, but Jordan is asking something very particular. And he's frustrated. And I'm frustrated because he's not getting the answer. But that's not good enough in the context of morality. What is, what are we striving towards? To me to be the same notion as this subsidiary structure. So and now so he's going to politics again. It. So you've got because your wife, let's say. Sure. Okay. Well, his mind goes. Through this long run. Sure. And your narrow individuality is integrated into the broader dyad of yeah, that we're, group. We're all Venn diagrams. Okay, okay. Right? Then you yeah. do that there's with your you, family. There's you and your coworkers, there's you and your employees, there's you and your friends, there's you and your... I mean, more Venn diagrams, kind of, all right? Daughter, you, you and your, your city, yeah, you and your town. Yes, yes. Right, okay. okay. You and so your we, peers. Right, so we agree on that. Yes, okay, so well, so But again, all Venn diagrams oriented towards what? Right, so my Venn diagram with my coworkers is oriented towards what? Each one of them has an orientation, but they're all consistent with my self-interest because they're all oriented towards my life. So it, it, that is so missing. All right, we've got a minute and a well, half. That's the polity that I'm thinking about. So how it's do you fluid? It? It's well, not, it's, it's not it, what it's, it, it well, changes all that you can right, quit but, your job, but, but you can podcast, right, right, get divorced. Right. But there's principle. It's not entirely fluid because no, it's not entirely fluid. Right. Right. It's hopefully it's optimally fluid. Sure. Right. Because it's, it's, it's the principles. Jordan is saying, what are they? Right. 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 Okay. So that's fine. And that optimal, I would say part of the marker of its optimality is fluidity. Yes. Right. Right. That's why the Tao is water, right? It's not stone. It has this capacity to adapt. And, and sometimes you have to cut your losses, and that's fine. The, the, right? The sunk cost, just because you've been in a relationship for 10 years, does not mean, well, I should continue it for, in perpetuity. Right. And well, at least any relationship. I don't mean marriage. It could be just your, your contractor you work with or a lawyer. Right. Well, so your, your point seems to me to be that your alliance in any of those subsidiary organizations shouldn't be a prison. Correct. Right. But it's something that's, that should be, that's something that thrives and needs maintenance and, and is re, reborn every single day. But again, the standard is life. Life. Happiness, flourishing, success. That's how you measure whether 
you should invest in it or not. Now, you guys are, uh, you know, talking about Jordan getting overexcited and emotional and whatever. Remember, this is 1.25 speed, so this is not his normal speed. So it's 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 not fair. Like to every judge single you. day, you, anyone has the option to get divorced or to not talk to their kids or to fire whoever. Or okay, to so, so, so if you accept the necessity of these embedded relationships, yes, multiple of embedded relationships. Enormous, it, okay, yeah. So why do you conceptualize that? Why exactly? I'm not trying to catch you out here. Okay, I'm curious. Well, why do you conceptualize that as anarchy? Because, because it's voluntary. Yeah, you see, this is where Jordan. This is where this conflation of anarchy and selfishness. Ah. Uh, it makes me mad. I mean, I, I, I was hoping he would say, why do you conceptualize that as selfishness or self-interest? But he goes to the political, he goes to the anarchy, and, and I think it, it goes off track at that point. So, I, I mean, the rest is about anarchy and about stuff, so I'll, I'll let you guys watch it if you want. Um, my interest was in the more... It, 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 Jordan was actually asking good questions, getting deep into some important issues related to self-interest, related to selfishness. There was an opportunity here to actually articulate a case uh, for Rand's morality, why a moral code based on, the, uh, based on human life, based on the, the, the survival, based on flourishing, why such a moral code is needed, why that is the measure of all things, that is the measure of human behavior, why that is what creates this conscience, uh, and if you have the wrong values, you can have a consciousness that's no good. That is, you don't have implicit in you, in your consciousness, in your conscience, um, the right morality. You have to first adopt the right morality if you have the right conscience. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other story. All right.